Okay, here we go. We are live and we will leave a moment or two for people to join. I'll just mention in the comments that anyone who does show up can say hi. So we know who's joined us. There we go. So yes, I'm Thula. I know it's been a very long day, but how's you, how are you doing apart from a bit of a cough? Um, I'm fine. Um, I think today's training went very well. Um, so yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's enjoyable seeing people get so, so much value. Um, so yeah, I know it was all right. Yeah, I was seeing quite a few people signing up to be local ACE ambassadors and we're, we're feeling quite passionate about it. So I always get a bit of <laughs> We had at least three want to become trauma champions, so that's something. Ooh, really good. News. Well, we've got a couple of people here. We've got Claire's joined us and Leslie. Hi, guys. Hello. Um, and Claire, you know. Hello, Claire. Leslie, yeah, hello. Leslie's, Leslie's come to quite a few lives now. Le Leslie yeah. brings some brilliant questions, so I'm looking forward to what um, mm -hmm. anything that might be added in the Q&A, really. Um, okay. But, yeah, as, as we let people join Anthula, mm -hmm. Um, why don't we start by introducing yourselves? Oh, Alex is here as well. Hi, Alex. Thanks for no, joining. Alex. That's a nice photo. <laughs> oh, there's lots of lovely photos on Facebook, Anthula. Um, yeah. Well, it's really now. The people that don't join, I forget them. Don't get it. So, <laughs> shall I hang on a bit longer before we get a few more people on? Oh, we'll give it a second. We can happily have a chat before getting properly into the details and, and, and kind of mention who we are, really. So I'm, I'm excited that we actually get to have more members of the, the core WAVE team on, um, as we've had great participation from all the ambassadors on these live streams, but it's harder to get a hold of the actual team with how busy they are. Um, so yeah, would you like to tell everyone a little bit more about how you got involved in WAVE and what your role is um, and what you're hoping to talk about today? Okay, so <clears throat> I have been with WAVE almost from the beginning, and WAVE has been in existence for 25 years. I met George, and uh, when he started talking about prevention of child abuse, um, although I knew about NSPCC, when he started talking about prevention, I thought, bing, the light bulb went on. This guy, he's got a different approach. This looks interesting, and it really just piqued my interest. At the time, I... Uh, been divorced from my violent ex-husband for a couple of years and so the more I started learning about WAVE the more it answered lots and lots of questions for me. At that time I was a solicitor in private practice and um, I was helping WAVE on a voluntary basis, pro bono basis and over the years I just got more and more sucked in because it's that sort of charity. The work is just brilliant and so unique and different in effect. I thought this I've never I mean I I make donations from time to time to various organizations but this was the first time I came across a charity I thought oh my god this is what I have to be involved with yep. and so um about 10 years ago I ditched my legal career and came into way full time and I had various roles I was helping to fundraise um I found a couple of major donors that supported us I I uh, have since 2001 uh, been company secretary, which is a, a role dealing with things like all the legal and charitable and governance and all, all the sort of all the important things at the back that people don't see that makes charity function. And I'm also a director. So in that role, I work on various projects. I've worked with the George in prison, in the community lots of different projects and I've been delivering presentations for WAVE for hmm, well about 10 years actually um so today when Isabel was saying what sort of a day have you had it was a day of training and I've got another whole day tomorrow of training another whole day on Thursday of training <laughs> so we're doing an awful lot of training uh, but it is rewarding because we're transforming the UK and today I'm open to answering questions about my lived experience of being a domestic violence victim. Um, I carry three aces from childhood and the research is really clear that if you have the more aces you have, the more likelihood there is of you being a perpetrator or a victim of domestic violence. And I was a victim. Yeah. 
Yeah. And yeah, I think I'm quite excited about having you on about on this because I know that we have quite a few members of Hearts of Ace that might themselves have experience with domestic violence. But because of, you know, your nearly, you know, over 20 years experience linked with WAVE, you're very much able to bring all of the research side and, and practice side in, in working on interventions for these issues, as well as your own lived experience to the table in this kind of conversation. Um, so yeah, to everyone who is watching, please say hi as you join, but also feel free to put questions in the comments throughout and, and I'll pick up on them as we go or when we stop for Q and A's. Um, but yes, Anthula, speaking of domestic violence, um, what do you think is most misunderstood about domestic violence? That's a big question. <laughs> um, when I when I was experiencing domestic violence, the the scene in those days this is going back about twenty years. <laughs> um, the scene then was that the police treated domestic violence as not their business. Mm. Oh, it's just another domestic. And what the issue was then was that. There wasn't legislation, there is now, but there wasn't then, legislation that made it a criminal offence for people to beat up their partners or worse, right. unless it became GBH or murder. Um, but for um, other offences, police didn't really want to get involved. And partly that was because a lot of domestic violence victims um, report and then retract. And so the police felt they were wasting a huge amount of time processing um, a case of domestic violence and very often for various reasons the the victims didn't proceed and help and work with the police to prosecution mm -hmm. at that time you didn't have an awful lot of um, choice as a victim I mean I'm a solicitor and I know the legal system and so for me what I was doing was um, just seeking a series of injunctions civil right. county court injunctions against him and most injunctions uh, have a power of arrest attached. Yeah. Um, and the power of arrest is only for six months. So unless you're seriously injured, the police won't get involved. Mm. Today, I think it's, it's different. But um, it was a, a, a crazy situation because normally a, an injunction would last for six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. And then when the time period has elapsed, guess what? He started again. So mm -hmm. I kept all the documentation. I had big files of everything that happened, all the threats he made to me and to others, and the abuse I suffered during the marriage. And um, eventually, after a succession of county court injunctions, uh, the, the, the last one, the, the county court judge said, well, this is ridiculous. He's clearly not going to learn his lesson. So he gave him a suspended prison sentence. So... Um, What's not known about domestic violence is that it doesn't end with divorce. Mm. I had 10 years of post-divorce harassment Oof. daily. And I mean daily. Mm. And it was lots of times a day. So it was morning, afternoon and evening. And it was knocks on the door, calls to the landline, calls to the mobile, um, mm talking to other people and sending messages, putting newspaper cuttings of men who murdered their partners through the front door, all sorts of things. I mean, that's just a, a, a small example. So a lot of domestic violence victims are harassed so much. That could be one reason why some of them actually say, I won't go through with the court cases, he will kill me. Mm -hmm. And you have um, Women's Aid, which has been around for a very long time, that do a lot to help women who are domestic violence victims but you know there's a lot of domestic violence against men yeah that's yeah. underreported why is it underreported well i think i was about to mix up that there's one in three domestic violence victims are men which is a lot, yeah. much larger percentage i think than i was expecting while still knowing yeah. that there were and male it's, it's only now that people acknowledged it uh, because in the past men just didn't want to lose their image um, mm. by admitting to being a victim. And then, of course, we, we know that there's a lot of domestic violence in same-sex marriages as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I knew one particular um, lady who'd had a succession of domestic violence partners. So it's very prevalent. It's everywhere. 
It really is. It's only now that we're beginning to see it for what it is, which is it's a crime against another human being. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in the street and someone attacks you, that's assault. They get arrested and processed. Well, it's the same whether it's in the home or on the street, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, there's a few different things you made me think of there. I think the first that you were saying the difference between kind of 20 years ago and now, um, I was kind of before this live looking at the um, Domestic Abuse Act in 2021. Um, and they were kind of defining domestic abuse as physical or sexual abuse, violent or threatening behavior, controlling or coercive behavior, economic abuse or psychological, emotional and other abuse. And I think that's a bit of a difference from what you were saying of just when it gets to extreme violence or that there are yeah, much yeah. bigger problems. There's no I, experienced, I experienced every single one of those. Mm. Um, I remember when I got my first really good legal job, I saw that he had, uh, he was profligate and not able to manage finances. And because I said I wanted a separate bank account, he strangled me. He almost to the point of death. Yeah. Yeah, and so, I think the economic yeah. one is, is yeah. one that's really quite prevalent. And I think, again, I've seen that, you know, often when we're talking about domestic abuse committed by women towards men, you know, you don't see it as much because you're thinking of the physical violence difference um, and the physical strength when there's all these other elements of abuse that are just as easily done um, yeah. and can be just as yeah. serious um, in terms yeah. of repercussions. I think the yeah. other one that really stuck with me is what you were saying about it continuing for so long and so persistently after the divorce. Because something I've heard again and again and again when having these, you know, when the topic comes up is why didn't they leave or that kind of situation. And it's like, even if you do leave, that's not a guarantee that you're safe. Mm -hmm. That's not a guarantee that it's over. Um, and I, yeah, I that's a very good point. Um, the reason why victims stay in marriages, there are lots of different reasons, but very often, the overriding um, reason is because the victim, whatever gender they are, the victim has very low self-esteem and they're controlled and manipulated and they're afraid. I mean, at one stage, my ex-husband grabbed my uh, youngest brother by the throat. So I was afraid for my family as well as for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I was afraid that um, unless I left the country, there was nowhere to hide because he always had the ability to find me from all the friends and family. But it's the low self-esteem is the big one. Yeah. 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 I wonder, yeah. so this is from a friend of mine who's also kind of gone through, you know, situations of domestic abuse that luckily never escalated to the levels you experienced. But how much of a role do you think isolation plays in domestic violence of, of isolating you from other people in your lives? That's a... Fantastic point you raise. That's really important. Most abusers uh, have a, 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 a an MO, a memorandum, a modus operandi. It goes like this: I don't like your friends. So and so is not good, and they they start like that, and they alienate you from your support mm -hmm. systems because that way they control you more. But the other point about alienation and being alone is really important. Is in the farming communities. Mm. Just imagine there's a farm surrounded by fields and your nearest neighbour is a mile or two or three or more away. People who are domestic violence victims in a rural setting really do feel trapped. Where do they go? They've got nowhere to live, no money. It's all in the farm and no one sees and no one reports on it. Mm. That's really a big one to, to think about. I'd never thought about the difference in where you are physically in that. I think I'd understood it on a metaphorical isn't the white world, but that, that kind of relationship isolation of kind of being cut off from people in your life. But I hadn't thought of it from a physical perspective of, you know, not being able to just walk out the house and meet someone else who might be able to see that you've got bruises or something else, but to actually be isolated physically as well. I think that's a really good point. Um, and yeah, there's, there's all kinds of different dynamics at play, I think, for, for different cases of domestic violence because of... And how do, you, how do you get into a car if you don't drive? How do you get into a car and drive off? What if there's only one car and he knows he's got the keys? So you're sort of stuck, aren't you? Unless mm -hmm. you get up at three o'clock in the morning and walk five miles or something. And if you've yeah. got kids, would you do that? It's a really difficult situation. 
A hundred percent agree. I've got a few more comments, but rather than go off on a long conversation myself, I'll read some of the great ones from from the the um, comments that we're getting now because I'm seeing lots of lots of great contributions. Um, well, I'll start going chronological order. Claire says here, how do you get someone who is in danger to help? Personally, I listen to no one, but when you know someone who is suffering, how do you approach that situation? I'm going to quickly jump here in here, and Frida, before you go, because um, as I said, I had a conversation around this recently with a friend of my own, and she said that it was very much listening to other people with lived experience that made the difference. It was being able to hear people in the same situation say this isn't okay or give her you know solutions that that really made her realize what was happening in a sense um but yeah i'd love to hear what you've got to say on that anthula i'll just hide the comment because i've been covering your face slightly there is someone there is um there is an organization that puts notices in ladies toilets and i've forgotten what it's called but they it's not overt but it's an invitation to have a conversation with them and it's a bit of a lifeline so when women respond to that they get help and why in women's toilets is because the men won't follow them in there right but um how do you get someone to get help well if you're being manipulated it's very difficult to think clearly right your thoughts are being um overtaken and controlled by somebody else it's quite hard i when i left the marriage i didn't it wasn't because I listened to anyone or someone said anything to me. Mm -hmm. uh, there were lots of people in my life who knew that I was very unhappy. And there were lots of people that suspected a lot of things, but they didn't, didn't know for sure. Why did I leave? I think I just got to the point where I snapped and I just thought, do you know, do I want to grow old with this man? I mean, I left when I was in my early 40s and I felt like a 90-year-old hag. I thought, I just can't take any more. Um, and it was really frightening because he was managing all the finances, controlling all the finances. And, you know, you think to yourself, well, where will I live? How will I survive? I, I took the two kids. It's, I was very fortunate because at that time, my brother had a house that he'd been renting, which was between rentals. So I went and stayed there. Um, and I was still running my office. Um, so I basically locked myself away from him locked him out of the office because he was supposed to be working there with me except he never did any work and um i was getting harassed he was pestering me he was knocking on the door kicking doors yelling at me and and at home he found out where i was because he knew that was my brother's house mm. um and harassed at work um and um, i just stuck to my guns and then as people heard about our, our split um i was really quite shocked because i hadn't expected it but i i got so many people being so supportive to me um and i thought that's really you know it helps it really helps you to to get get on and stick to your guns and stick to the very hard road you've taken mm -hmm. uh, but i don't know how you get someone to come out of a domestic violence relationship unless of course like you say i think probably one of the best things is to get someone who's been there and done that so yeah. i've you know i've traveled that road um well, i feel yeah. that thinking back to what we were saying about isolation i feel that if you approach the question head on you know and say explicitly oh you should leave them oh you should do it might just give ammo to the abuser to be able to say oh you see you can't trust that person oh you see they want to you know and flip the situation and kind of drive a wedge within those external support network relationships as well. So it's a very difficult one to answer and, and to manage, I think. Um, when, I, when I actually left, I put the kids and some basic belongings of ours in the car. I was about to drive off because he was out. He turned up just as I was driving off. <laughs> he was banging on the car. Come back, you can't go. <laughs> so it wasn't oh. easy. Oh, oh well. Um, so I'm just look, gotten distracted by all the extra good comments we're getting in the meantime. Um, not very attuned, I apologise. Um, yes, yeah, so I think we're getting some great comments from Debbie and Claire. Again, isolation plays a massive part until it's just you and them. Um, Debbie saying it has a huge impact. 
she got cut away from her family and friends, even took the car. So again, what you were saying, that kind of physical isolation as well as, as that emotional support isolation. Um, oh, this is a really good one from Alex, but I am going to come back to that just to see if anyone else has commented anything else because that's a long answer, I think. Um, mm -mm. Yeah, so there's quite a few questions. They all around, ultimately, the impact on children of domestic violence and how, you know, they are victims themselves. Um, That's a little overdue. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'd love to hear far more on this because I know that we always say that in terms of our 70-30 campaign as well. We're reducing child abuse and neglect and domestic violence. And it's very much because witnessing violence can be extremely... Uh, traumatic for children so yeah well, yes. what's kind of your your insight into all totally, that? totally totally agree in the uh, um in a few years ago we had a different website and on that website we had various videos one was of me talking about my my um experience and in that video i explain how it has really damaged my children mm. uh, particularly yeah. the eldest the youngest was about three when i left so he wasn't as badly damaged but the eldest one was about 13 yeah. He had seen um, and heard a lot. He'd seen his father aim a gun at me. He'd uh, seen his father coming home and dr drunk. He'd seen his father being abusive. Um, I think he was too small to realise, I think he was about five when I had my ribs broken. But the point is, he was older, so he had more exposure to it. So he's more damaged. And, you know, for 20 years, he's had nothing to do with anyone in his family either side, his father's or his mother's, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And he's a very angry, very bitter, uh, difficult person. And when my youngest child became a teenager, I found his brother, put him in touch with him. But they're so, so different. I mean, the youngest child is such a loving, compassionate human being. And they just have nothing in common. So they don't have a relationship. And the eldest one is replicating a lot of the behavior he saw. That's the important point to note about how damaging mm -hmm. is. He, he is a mini version of his father. And he is replicating the behavior he saw. And he's now divorced because he did the same to his wife. And he's doing it to his brother because he's trying to manipulate and co coerce him. So the youngest and the eldest don't have anything to do with each other. And the eldest child has this serious problem because he's got no family around him. Mm -hmm. I find it really interesting what you're seeing there about kind of replicating the behavior. I think we've spoken on a lot of previous lives about breaking into generational cycles. Um, and I think, yeah, looking at kind of the root causes of violence, having witnessing that violence and experiencing that violence are absolutely at the heart of violent behavior. Um, I think children will either replicate what they've seen or have a total aversion to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unfortunate for me that he replicated his father's behaviour because whilst that was going on, he did have loving uh, relationships uh, with other members of the family, me, grandparents, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, his father's behaviour was so extreme that it did impact him. Yeah. He could as easily have become the total opposite of his father, but unfortunately he didn't. Yeah, and unfortunately everyone is different and everyone is in different situations. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, Will's joined us as well. Thanks for joining, Will. Um, so yeah, what, what do you think would make a difference in protecting children in domestic violence situations? Because obviously we often talk about um, you know, if we're talking about, for example, how do we get help to, to people in domestic violence situations? How can you support children in that? Because I know that it's often looked at from a, the perspective of taking children out of the situation as the only solution. Do, do you think there's other ways of approaching it? Do you think what would make... Well, the first, first and foremost, um, I think we're not doing enough to support families in the very earliest years of life. We're just not. Mm -hmm. Other countries do it much, much better than we do. We have this attitude which says, oh, let's not interfere. Let them just get on with it. Well, it's no good because 
if parents have had a bad experience themselves and they don't know the basic skills for looking after children, then how is that going to be any of any use? Mm -hmm. We've got to prevent uh, by educating and forming and empowering families. That's the first thing. Um, and secondly, I think we've got to um, teach relationship skills. Uh, yes. We we and Wave uh, created a report called PrEP, Parenting Relationship and Education uh, something, um, mm -hmm. for the Scottish Government. For Wait, them I to need use... to pass it for two seconds. Yeah, it's, it's, no, it's, it's, it's such a long time ago. Uh, but nobody's using it, or very few people are using it. And I think what a lost opportunity that was, because the PrEP toolkit is designed to be used with young people from 14 to 16 before they become parents yeah teaching teaching males how to be positive males for children teaching females some of the skills they need because if you're preparing the future parents by putting this into their learning that's mm -hmm. preventative and that's got to be a great way forward right um if we're doing that we're teaching what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in any relationships, let alone romantic relationships. Yeah. And it should be there long before people form romantic relationships. It's quite clear, the evidence is clear that if, if in their teenage years, um, young people uh, become perpetrators or victims of domestic violence in the relationship in those early years, that tends to be the pattern that they have going forward mm. for the future. And you see this very clearly in uh, women later on in life who escape uh, violent marriages. And many, many of them, quite a lot of those women, um, go into subsequent violent relationships. Mm. Um, it sounds illogical and irrational, but that does happen. Yeah. And the men, well, you know, if, if the woman divorces him and leaves him, they'll marry someone else and they'll do the same to her. Now, when I say men, it could happen men, women, women to men, right? I'm just generalizing here. So the pattern of relationship is established in those early years. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at something recently which said that um, intimate partner relationship is hugely, ex uh, it's like something like 60% in the university population. So you can see it's already established there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it, I, I fully agree with what you say about established early on, because in a sense, you, you start to test boundaries in relationships and what is acceptable in relationships outside of what you were used to in your own family um, in those years. And it's a moment when we could be supporting people and giving them the tools to communicate better, to handle their own anger better, to, you know, do so many different things, to give them life skills in that moment. Um, but instead, we kind of let them get into patterns. And as you said earlier, at the core of this is impacts on self-esteem. And, you know, if you have one relationship in which that happens, unless you have a lot of effort and a lot of support, you can't suddenly improve your self-esteem out of nowhere. And that kind of sets you up for someone else to take advantage in a sense, or for you to have to externalize those self-esteem issues in some way. So I can fully see how that can kind of be perpetuated later in your lifetime. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's kind of linked to that, of it continuing that, that kind of longer term perspective. Do you think that there's a pattern of it gradually getting worse in the sense that is it usually a situation of, as you were saying, with, with the isolation of, oh, but I don't really like those friends kind of a thing. And then it escalates rather than it being, you know, as bad as it can be very early in the relationship. Um, well, in my experience, um, it, it was pretty, the, the isolating me from friends, um, happened fairly early on in the relationship um ultimately my ex-husband was a coward he was someone that was abused himself as a child and he was a coward and he picked a soft target which was myself 
But um, I, although I had low self-esteem, I did have very, very close relationships with uh, my mother and my um, family. And he knew how far not to go. Right. So if he, if, he, if he tried to stop me completely from having anything to do with my family, he realized that he might lose me. Mm. So although he still manipulated and controlled a lot of it, um, he had to put up with some of that. And that was my lifeline in a way. But right. I can imagine that if someone doesn't have anyone around them, that's a hopeless situation. That really is very, very much tougher than what I had. And I had it tough. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And I think it's very hard to put a, a, a what do you call it, a, a um, quantifier on how tough the situation can be, really, because everyone has different buttons, different triggers to different things. And obviously, you know, you can have physical violence escalating to the point of very literally your own life being at risk and the lives of the people you love being at risk. But even in situations in which you're just experiencing, say, psychological and emotional abuse, it can still get extremely damaging. I think I was seeing something from Victim Support Scotland saying that 96% of domestic abuse is psychological and emotional. Um, yeah. And it still has devastating impacts on people. It does, it does. And everyone's levels of resilience are different. And everyone's levels of self-esteem and their early life experiences and ACEs are all different. So you can't generalise as such, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the comments at the moment, but please do add them, guys, if, if you've got any, and we can kind of flag that up. Um as we go. Um, so probably the biggest question of tonight, Anthula. Um, so we're kind of timing this live based on the 16 days of actions against domestic violence that are currently going on until the 10th of December. What actions do you think would have the biggest effect on two different levels? One, preventing domestic violence and two, on supporting current victims? Well, on prevention, I really do think that teaching what healthy relationships are in school to children long before they're uh, ready to leave school and become parents is crucial. Because if children are growing up with unhealthy romantic relationships in the home, they don't know what good is. So why aren't, why aren't we teaching this? Um, one of the programs that Wave brought to the UK is a program called Roots of Empathy. And although it doesn't focus specifically on domestic violence, it teaches what empathic parenting is. And if you create empathic human beings, they don't become perpetrators of domestic violence because empathy is the greatest uh, uh, prevention uh, tool that you can have. People who carry empathy for others, people who are compassionate, do not want to go around beating people up. Yeah. So you, we've got to create empathic human beings very early in life, in the home, mm -hmm. by um, helping families understand that, and also teaching good, what good relationships are to young people before they enter relationships. That's the preventive element. Yeah. And just on the preventive element, I'm just going to highlight Will just asking for some clarification there. Are we talking about a life class in schools? I think, in a sense, we are. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what you mean by life class, but yes. I mean, the prep toolkit that we got, we, we prepared for the Scottish Government is a life class in a way. It's about uh, healthy relationships. But actually, um, I'm going to digress here because I think schools are not fit for purpose. They, they have this complete and utter um, focus on results and tests and results. And a lot of uh, children who are not academic switch off. We should be teaching children life skills, mm -hmm. whether it's relationships, whether it's um, skills like cooking, sewing, handiwork, all the things that disadvantaged children end up not being eating well because they don't know how to cook, for instance. Mm -hmm. So a life class, yes, with lots of different elements to it. That's That would be great. I fully agree with that. I was appalled that I was able to graduate 
without knowing how to vote or how to pay taxes or do yeah. all of that, you know, how to manage a budget and all those things and was just kind of expected to be able to navigate life. But I knew poems off by heart. So, you know, I, I, I definitely agree on that one. And yes, I interrupted you in terms of what actions can we take to protect um, victims now? Um, that's a complex one. Um, victims, uh, as I said, generally have poor self-esteem because if they didn't, the minute they got hit or the minute they got manipulated, they'd say, so do you, I'm off. <laughs> so we've got to create an environment for victims to build their self-esteem, to learn assertiveness, mm -hmm. to learn how to manage their finances and cope with being on their own until they've sorted their lives out. Apart from all the other things that women's aid do, which is give them refuge, because obviously the first and most important thing is finding a home. Mm -hmm. But society doesn't have this... It's not in the public domain that support for domestic violence is important. It's not treated as important. Mm -hmm. And so... If it's happening, people don't feel that there's anywhere they can turn to. Yeah. So I think you've got to somehow create a society that talks openly about the very high levels of uh, abuse, whatever the relationships are, and that this is totally not acceptable. It's really damaging to the children, and we should not stand for it. And we should have really severe penalties, and we should have perpetrators being required to go to sessions for healing because they are damaged individuals who are damaging others and they need to be healed. In America, they've got specialist um, domestic violence courts. Mm. And what happens there is that the judges are specializing in domestic violence. And what they do is they don't just say, you're good, you're bad. That doesn't heal anything because he'll go on and do it again. What yeah. they say is, if this relationship can't be repaired, okay, separate. But both parties need support, healing, therapy to overcome what is driving that behavior. Because as we say in our trauma training, mm -hmm. trauma is in the individuals who lash out on others. Yeah. It's the behavior that's bad, not the human that's bad. The human yeah. has this symptom which shows up as beating people up. But that human underneath is suffering. That is not a he healthy, happy human being. It can't mm. be. And so they're left to fester and maybe repeat their behavior. So we need a lot more acknowledgement of the levels of domestic violence. And we need a lot more money put into healing people. Because the cost to the society isn't just to the families and the children and the next generation. The cost to society permeates at every level, mm -hmm. whether it's the welfare system, the criminal justice system, um, the housing system. It, it, you know, it, it, it seeps into so many areas and it costs us a lot of money picking up the pieces. And then not, we're not even doing that properly. Yeah. So it's, it's about healing. I fully agree on the healing, healing both victims and the perpetrators of understanding that, um, yeah, they're usually both coming from a place of abuse themselves or at least trauma themselves um, that, that needs to be healed and looked at. Um, yeah. I have a question about the impact of COVID, but I think I will flag up Natalie's question first. Thank you for joining, Natalie. Um, how would you address the postcode lottery when it comes to refuges? I watched a documentary and there seems to be a lack of bed for vi beds for victims. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know how many refuges there are. I suspect there are far, far too few. Mm. Um, and it, really it's about political change, isn't it? Because if the government can find billions to pay to rich businesses to come up with COVID vaccines, but they can't be bothered to help build the families of tomorrow. We mm. need to get investment um, so that we can support people who are victims because it's not just the victims, it's the subsequent generations. Yeah. No, definitely. It's getting the shift in perspective. And as you said, 
earlier in terms of the you know the physical isolation in rural areas for example you know it, it's understanding where there's a higher risk for these issues and what kind of support you know even things like what you're saying about universities having quite a high statistics it's having that awareness in all the different places of how can we help sorry i've got the cat joining in in the meantime it's lovely but, um, <laughs> <laughs> she can be very demanding when she wants attention. But um, yeah, I, I think it's a slow battle to to make sure that we're we're um, putting the money where it will have the biggest impact, really. Yeah. Um, I'm just checking to see if there's any other quick result questions, but I think that's it for now. So yeah, I know that when COVID first hit, one of my first thoughts went out to people stuck in abusive situations be it children or you know families or whatever suddenly being even more isolated being stuck in one location where the abuse happened etc yes. yeah. um and there have been various you know scientific reports on this so i'm not necessarily claiming to go into all of that detail um but what do you think has been the impact on, of covid on these issues well a lot of a lot of professionals are saying what we're saying which is that COVID has really set us back, set us back. So I, there was a time before COVID where a lot of children who are in abusive situations, it got picked up, it got picked up in school, it got picked up in, in other settings, and now it doesn't get picked up. And we all know, we all know that levels of child abuse, levels of domestic violence are through the roof because it's all behind closed doors. COVID, you can't come in. Mm -hmm. it's shocking really really shocking an idea a, a story almost that springs to mind for me i remember seeing a video on social media about um it was a domestic violence court case but it was happening via zoom um because that was all that was possible during covid and it, i think the lawyer one of the lawyers i don't remember if it was prosecution or not um noticed that something was up and had police show up at the door house uh, that the woman was testifying in um, and found that the abuser was in the other room or was behind the screen. And whilst they appeared on different screens and he was claiming to be somewhere else entirely, you know, during the court proceedings when she was supposed to be witnessing against him, they were in oh. the same house alone. And, you know, I just think of that kind of situation of not having, having that security um, and thank God the lawyer noticed in that one instance. But I wonder, you know, what other situations happened like that during COVID? Mm, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. yeah. And I think, as you said, of, of not being able to pick up on it as well. Um, you don't have all, you don't have people going to school, but you don't have people going to extracurricular activities either. You don't have people working in offices and having all of those contacts with other people where you could notice something was wrong. Yeah, that's right. So I think we're going to see um, a lot of really much more serious social problems in the coming years, all developing last year and this year. Mm. I mean, beyond the domestic violence situation, even just mental health and substance abuse yeah, yeah. during COVID um, really? have, have been huge. I've seen far too many studies on um young people being particularly impacted you know school age up until universities being dreadfully impacted by covid um yes. a number you know mental health stress self-harm um all of those increasing drastically so i think we will be unpacking the repercussions of this for quite oh. a few years to come yes that's right i agree yeah does anyone have any other questions please feel free to drop them in the comments um and let us know um i think we've got a, quite a few people still on today so we'll see if anyone comes up with anything um i'm trying to think of the best question really to make the most of our time um let me have a look at my data here quickly mm -mm -mm. Yeah, how do you think we can protect people from that? Well, Jen's been trying to ask a question for a while. Sorry, Jen, let me see if I've missed one of your questions. Um, what's this one? Hi, the government has made it much easier to get a divorce. Your partner cannot object and you don't have to prove the accusation. 
Because they send out a message that society generally doesn't think it's worth fighting for the family life now. Well, that's a philosophical question. Maybe I shouldn't be asking. <laughs> um, it's a really hard one, isn't it? Um, when I when I presented my divorce petition, my ex-husband laughed. He didn't take it seriously. He said, yeah, ha, 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 you, you won't go through with it. He signed it. But a lot of people fight, and that just adds more problems. And the old law used to be that you had to prove the allegations. And how do you prove it? It's if you've kept records of various things. Um, or you had to be separated separated for two years and the other one agrees, or five years and the other one doesn't agree. Um, but it's not so much the divorce that the, that's the issue, I think. It's more safe, being safe when you don't want to stay living with that person, whether you're divorced from them or not, because he signed the papers, how ha, you won't go through with it. I did go through with it. I got the divorce uh, finalised, but he still gave me 10 years of grief afterwards. Mm. So divorce isn't the only issue here, is it? Should divorce be so easy? I don't know. Um, well, I think, as you were saying earlier, in terms of, Domestic violence doesn't just happen with a man attacking a woman and it doesn't just happen with a woman attacking a man. It also happens in more complex family dynamics, be that LGBT, be it, you know, people looking after the same child who might not be in a romantic relationship, be it, you know, there's many different dynamics. So I think that, at least from my perspective, it definitely goes beyond divorce, you know, and, and it goes back to that being able to have healthy relationships of whatever type they might be um, and being able to keep both members safe. Um, so I, I personally definitely see divorce as a very legal side of things in the same way of, you know, is it a case of just keeping the victim safe or is it a case of prosecuting you know the abuser in turn and, and going from there so yeah i think it's really a complex situation there jen yeah. that you've tapped into so we'll be interested to see other people's comments uh, as well on that um and just checking again yeah what kind of role when we were talking earlier about solutions we were saying very much raising awareness around these issues and making sure that people are talking about it and understand the prevalence. What role do you think stigma plays in domestic abuse? Oh, a lot. Um, I married my ex-husband against the wishes of my family. They didn't like him. Um, and so for a long time, I felt, well, you made your bed, you have to lie on it. But stigma was a big thing for me. I didn't want to be, be a divorced woman. It wasn't about ego. It was about, you know, society treats divorced women differently, doesn't it? It's not good to be divorced, is it? My father abandoned my mother and left her with five children. And I saw that in our community, a tight-knit Greek community in London, we were the only broken home. And people mm. treated us very differently. So I didn't want to be divorced. So that had a big, played a big, big factor. And I'm sure a lot of people think that too. If I'm on my own, will people respect me? Will they, you know, pester me? Whatever. When I got divorced, I I had a, a person who knew our, our family very well tell me he wanted a relationship with me. This was a married man. I thought, for heaven's sake. So you have all this going on. Oh, well, you're on your own. You need a bloke. I'm married. doesn't matter. You can be my bitch on the side. There's a, there are a lot of other things to think about when you're divorcing. <laughs> Needless to say, I wasn't interested. <laughs> <laughs> you, you definitely do better, I think. <laughs> I did. I did very much better. <laughs> good, good. But, yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, stigma around these issues goes to so many things. It goes to the broken homes. It goes yes. to the... Um, divorce side of things. I think of phrases like daddy, daddy issues and mummy issues and all of that kind of judgment around having had trauma. Um, it comes around what we were saying earlier, like why didn't you leave and all that kind of questions of, of really 
victim blaming in a sense um and even just the stigma of not talking about it you know seeing that people in you know maybe toxic relationships not understanding the full extent of what might be going on behind closed doors but still just kind of being that's their problem um and not talking about it um and i think yeah it, it's it's a slow push that i hope that things like you sharing your own experience and Pete's and Hearts of Ace sharing their own experience will will be able to slowly change and normalize that this is something far too common and that needs to change, but that we can talk about um, to, to shift things really in that sense. Mm. Um, will saying we definitely need a trauma-informed society to, to deal with this. Yes, yes. And as we uh, train more and more people and others as well, not just us, train more and more people in a trauma-informed approach in all our services and in our communities, because we're working towards trauma-informed communities. Mm -hmm. So as more and more people in the UK, whatever they uh, do, uh, hear about a trauma-informed approach, over, over the coming years and over the coming decades, we hope that um, things will improve substantially. We'll create um, a society which doesn't tolerate this, which wants to he hear and listen to people um, mm. because 20 years ago if you were in a domestic violence situation ba people basically didn't really want to get involved did they yeah they didn't. You, you felt i felt you felt that people didn't want to know they wouldn't know what to do they didn't want to get in between you know you and him and stuff like that so that should all go that should all go so that we have communities and societies they're there to support everybody. Uh, so it doesn't mean making him wrong. If we had a community that was all trauma reformed, then that community would um, support her and also support him and say, well, you know, let's see how we can handle the, the trauma that's running your behavior here. Yeah. For instance. No, I think that makes a huge difference. And I also think that in a trauma informed society, you're more used to asking questions you know, are you okay? How can I support you? How can I help? Et cetera. And you're more likely to have those conversations on both yeah. sides of things that might, you know, give you a bit more of that insight for what we were saying of COVID where you're now missing so many warning yeah. signs. I think the trauma informed society would be the opposite of, of you'd be yeah. able to catch up yeah. to situations much sooner. Yeah. Um, in a sense. Yeah. And victims would feel safer opening up. They'd feel that they're going to get a listening ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and talking of trauma, I know that something that you've mentioned on our training courses before has been the aftermath, in a sense, of, of these experiences. So, so once you're out of the situation, I don't necessarily mean after the divorce when you were still being harassed. I mean, kind of once you are out of the actual danger, because um, I know that you often bring up examples for triggers to old yes. trauma, for example, locations yeah. and stuff. What do you yeah. think? You know, what was your experience of kind of that aftermath of, of, of picking yourself up again after that experience? Um, it took a long time for me to heal, mainly because it wouldn't leave me alone. Um, I did a lot of personal development courses, which did a massive amount to rebuild my self-esteem and my confidence. Um, the lost my train of thought uh i suppose i began to um trust myself that i can build a good life for myself because that i was i was actually very very afraid mm. um and i had to i was responsible for two children so yeah. i had to make a go of it um when i left him my eldest son although he was severely traumatized and we see now that you know he's had 20 years of living away from family and friends um the first thing he said to me was oh i'm so glad we're no longer all living together mm -hmm. but i was afraid that he wouldn't want a split right. so there are lots of considerations coming into the picture there hmm. yeah yeah i think it it i think i'm always blown away with the and i think that's the value of the voice of lived experience by the diversity 
an experience and yet that kind of underlying shared experience of, of I guess the emotional side of things perhaps of, of the impact of trauma on their bodies of that kind of impact on self-esteem impact on mental health impact on other relationships even though the dynamics and all the considerations and fears were so different um but it's often yeah and, yeah and he, healing takes a long time actually because um in one in, in our trainings i sometimes talk about a particular trigger that i have or had i don't have any more um, so I lived with my ex-husband in Ealing in West London. Um, and for years after the divorce, I couldn't go to Ealing. It triggered me. I used to remember all the horrible things and I hated it. I wouldn't go there. And then about five or six years after the divorce, I had a, um, I was working as a locum solicitor, which is a bit like tempting. And the agency found me a job in Ealing. And I thought long and hard about taking that job. I thought, oh, do I really want to go to Ely? <laughs> but anyway, I took the job. It was only two weeks. But when I was there, I was looking over my shoulder all the time, I tell you. And I was quite nervous. It was like, go there. Don't go out at lunchtime. And then when you finish, go straight to the train and go home. <laughs> mm. um, and maybe having to go there for work was the sort of like the time when I started thinking, do you know what? How does he know I'm even in the area? <laughs> yeah. So triggers can last a lifetime or they can last for a very long time. Um, and I would now go to Ealing. It's not my favourite place. It's too far from where I am now. But I wouldn't now be afraid to go there. So mm -hmm. triggers are very, very important to bear in mind that lots of things can tr trigger you. So um, if I'm driving the car and, uh, and someone who's a passenger gets really shirty with me that that could trigger me because I remember once I was driving the car and I had family members in the car my mom my auntie and my elder son and he was in the front seat and he was drunk he'd had a lot to drink mm -hmm. and as I was driving on a very busy M40 he started getting abusive for no reason and just hit me in the face as I was driving the car and that could have killed us all yeah yeah so I immediately pulled over got off the um, M40, uh, the A40, and I said, look, I'm not driving anymore unless you promise to behave yourself or else we're not going anywhere. Well, then he calmed down. But, you know, shouting at me or raising your voice at me if I'm driving a car could trigger me. Mm. And I yeah. start shaking, getting nervous, and I might not drive very well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, can you – so I know that you – You've shared this constantly in trainings, but I know that not everyone watching this will have had, you know, some trauma training. So could you go into a little bit more detail of what it means to be triggered? What that, what happens in that moment when you are triggered? You know, what happens on an emotional level, on a rational level in your body? Because I think it is quite important yeah. to understand that it's not you overreacting. Yeah. yeah. So when, um, when, a, when you have a trauma, whether it's a childhood trauma or an adult trauma, your body stores the trauma. It's not just all in your head. You actually physically feel it and store it somewhere in your body. Mm -hmm. There's a great book by a world trauma expert called Bessel van der Kolk. And the book is called The Body Keeps the Score. So your body locks that trauma away. So if you have another trauma similar to the one that's already happened, then that trauma goes on top of the other one and so on and so forth. So you could have a whole bunch of similar traumas all stacked on top of each other. And then something happens today and all those past emotions that your body has locked in suddenly erupt like a volcano. It just goes Pfft, and it looks like you've overreacted to something that wasn't so extreme. But what, what we need to get across is that that overreaction isn't actually an overreaction. It's someone whose body has brought all the past traumas together and just lumped them into one and boom. Mm -hmm. Now, there's the logical part of the brain, the front part, is not the part that's in control at that stage. It's your emotional brain that's in charge. And we know from the science that traumatized children, traumatized young people, have an overdeveloped trigger response. You know, we all have fight or flight. We're, it's built into us that if there's danger, we run <laughs> or hide or freeze, depending on the circumstances. But traumatized people have overdeveloped uh, head trigger responses. And that overdeveloped head trigger response 
is was used for survival. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes you see people, if you see somebody overreacting, what you're actually seeing is someone who's got a lot of trauma that's all come out at the same time, maybe. Yeah. And what's running the show is the trigger, the emotional brain, not the logical brain. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah I, I just think it was really important to share that as not everyone has that kind of background yeah. understanding of what it means to be triggered I think it's one of those words that's become more popular in the sense that that's lost some of its meaning in, in common everyday language yes, um, it has. so it, it's kind of worth mentioning what yes. we actually mean by triggered well, I'm, I'm um, glad to put that across yeah <laughs> Yeah, so we've got a question that's not necessarily immediately relevant to the live stream, but we've only got a couple of minutes left. So I will flag it up just in case you wanted to, you know, quickly mention something. Right. And we can happily talk about this separately in a different live or in an email or put out a nice post or blog post or something on the website if yes. it's relevant. Um, okay. But William asks, um, what do you think of the budget of 700 million for drug services in England? Uh, I'm aware of this one, but... What I can say to you is that we're still not doing it right. We're not handling the drug issue correctly. Um, in, in our report, which you can get on the website, called 2 to 18, Systems to Protect Children from Severe Disadvantage, we show quite clearly how Iceland and Portugal, and now parts of America, have got a drugs policy that makes a lot more sense. It's decriminalization and treatment. We're not doing that. And we're not going to have any impact if we don't understand that people just don't do drugs. People are using drugs to escape the mental torture of the trauma that's in their life. Mm -hmm. They call it self-medication. It's the same with alcohol. And we need to help people constructively, not just sort of stick them in rehab and hope they, they're okay. We need to address the trauma. We need to understand and heal that trauma that drives that behavior and decriminalize it. Because criminalizing people for using something to help them cope with life is, is daft. Yeah, and it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't. It doesn't. And yeah, I will say to anyone, we've done another um, live stream on substance abuse. I know Will spoke as well. And you can find that on our YouTube channel and on the 7030 page on Facebook. So if you are interested in finding out more, do check that out um, and see there. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. There's there's no other main questions for now. So thank you so, so much, Anthula, for coming on. I know it's been a very long day, but um, I think this has been a really, really valuable conversation um, to have. Thank you to everyone for sharing your comments and some of your own experiences in the chat. Um, I think they were extremely valuable as well. So um, I do hope that... Um, you have gotten enough out of this and anyone who's watching this on catch up as well. Thank you for um, joining us. And yes, I will be joining you again for a future live. I think in the new year, we haven't scheduled it yet, but this is officially our last live stream for 2021. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you again, Anthula. Bye. Bye. Bye.